Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 10, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. And um, on today's show, we're going to be going through industry, um, give you guys a little bit of an update of what's been going on in the world of film. Uh, then we're going to be joined by the lovely Abby Hill. Uh, she actually has her own company called Dizzy Hills um, Company. So yeah, we're going to be interviewing her. Sam's got the pleasure of doing that. And then we're going to actually uh, be reviewing The Hunt. Uh, so with the way that the film industry is at the moment, it's all being done through digital download. So we actually sat and watched it last week. So without further ado, Sam, do you want to hit us up with some industry news? Okay. Uh, so obviously with the with everything that's been going on, a lot of films have um, production delays. It's kind of obvious. The Batman, Matrix 4, finally Mission Impossible. Tom Cruise did try to continue filming in London. Yeah. Weeks ago when he left Italy, going to London, figured it would be a better place to be. Clearly wrong there. But it's kind of interesting, despite all these mass production delays, some films have ca uh, announced some casting. So Ryan Gosling is to star in a new sci-fi film called Hail, uh, Hail Mary, which is from the author of The Martian. Remember the uh, Matt Damon yeah. film by Ridley Scott? This is coming up from MGM, who desperately need a hit, otherwise they will be sold to one of the streamers. MGM has been struggling for a good couple of years, and there's been rumours of Netflix or Amazon or even Apple wanting to buy them for their back catalogue. I personally think this is a really boring sounding film, it's another story like The Martian about a one man who has to go and save the planet. And I don't know, like, I get it, it's, it's playing off the old school kind of Hollywood charm. And that's what Ryan Gosling has. But Ryan Gosling is also a brilliant actor. And he could do a lot better than that. Talking of other actors who are doing things that sound kind of dull. Uh, Ryan Reynolds. All the Ryans today. <laughs> yeah. Ryan Reynolds is working with Netflix on a version of the computer game Dragon's Lair which is an old arcade game from 1981 apparently it's really kind of odd again it's not exactly a, the most popular game in the, out of games they could have made films and again because it's Ryan Reynolds it's probably going to have his usual version of comedy which is getting again a little bit stale and repetitive like despite the uh, the dull Re Ryan's <laughs> There's a more <laughs> interesting uh, casting note. George Miller has finally decided to do a spin-off on Mad Max Fury Road. There's always been talk of there being a, um, a spin-off about Furiosa, which we all kind of assumed would be starring Charlize Theron. But apparently it's a prequel. And instead, the casting... Um, obviously during quarantine right now, George Miller has been talking on Skype to the actress... Anya Taylor-Joy, who is a brilliant actress. If anyone's seen The Witch, she was the lead in The Witch. Uh, she's also in the film Sp uh, Splice, which I, or Glass. You know, you know those yeah, two, yeah. M. Night Shyamalan? Uh, I'm not Split, gonna... isn't it, and Glass. That's it, not Splice, yeah. So, like, I, I think that's an interesting casting. I, I think she's a really good actress who can, who, you can see her. You can see her in the role. And you can see how it would work. The very fact that he's even getting to do another Mad Max film is amazing. The guy's nearly 80. I didn't think there was ever going to be another one, seeing as how long it took to make Fury Roads. And also, if anyone knows about any of the legal fights that Warner Brothers has been having with um, George Miller and his production company, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't had a Mad Max for so, so long. But hopefully, if all goes well, we'll have a new Mad Max film soon. What were those legal issues like? I believe it's, it's literally to do with um, the cut of money. So how much money was made from Fury Roads for the companies that were involved in Australia. Legal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we discussed last week about how the BAFTAs are looking to go towards streaming for their awards or more towards the films that are going to be nominated. And it seems the Golden Globes are going to go with the same thing. It's not a bad thing. Yep. Will the Oscars follow? That's, that's why everyone's going to be wondering. You think, you think they're going to have to, aren't they? Because they can't just put their fingers in their ears and ignore. No. No, no, I, I feel like, yeah, it would just be, otherwise it'd be like, what's the point? Just, just don't do it that year if you have to stick to your rigid rules, and that's kind of pointless in itself. Mm. Talking of rigid rules, the Cannes Film Festival has definitely decided to postpone, which is good, and they're going for the end of June. What I thought was kind of interesting is they're, they're not going to go for an online option 
Khan is too prestige to go completely <laughs> online. But the, um, I apologize for pronunciation, the, the Palais de Festival, which is the um, kind of the place where they run the festival, is now a homeless center in France, oh. which is kind of crazy, really, for one of the most elite prestige film festivals in the whole entire world that is all about glamour and money and can't run this year, despite the fact they desperately wanted to run, they couldn't, and now it's being used to help people who have nowhere to go. It's a nice touch. Yeah. You think if anything that would mean that the, the French government was more likely to bail them out if they couldn't do it and then, you know, didn't have the insurance coverage as we've discussed before, so yeah. Yeah, this is uh, a good thing. If yeah. anything, this, yeah. is, this is much better than throwing the film festival. Mm. But we'll see soon and there are rumours that the films are probably going to be The Grand Dispatch by uh, Wes Anderson and maybe even Christopher Nolan's new film which comes out in July, ties it up nicely. We'll see. Next up on the Trash Arts Take, we have an interview with Abby Hills. How are you doing, Abby? I'm good, Sam. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right. It's, you know, it's all self-inclusion and stuff, but it's all good. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> now, Abby Hills runs the Daisy Hill Company, which is a talent agency based in Southampton. Could you tell us a bit about the uh, Daisy Hill Company? Yeah, sure. So, um... It's my little talent agency and production company. It's been running for about a year now. Um, I sort of I started it on the back of doing my masters, um, and yeah, it's really really taken off. So I manage models and actors, uh, a couple of musicians, and production crew. So I basically find everybody work, and then we make a bunch of cool stuff in house as well. What made you want to start a, a talent agency? I think, like, growing up, because I, I did a bit of acting and then sort of modelling through my young and early teens and then sort of leading up to before I started making films. And there is nothing in sort of the Hampshire area or even, I'd go as far as to say, the South or outside of London, there really isn't talent representation and talent management. And I think, like, as somebody going out on their own, London is quite scary. And... So I sort of noticed this gap in the market and I thought, well, you know, I've just done a course in business. I know about film. Let's, let's give it a go. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, like, as a filmmaker in Portsmouth, when I used to talk to City Council and they, they didn't really have a film department, it was more of a tourism department. And it just kind of yeah. felt like no cities really thinking about filmmaking or trying to progress talent from, you know, like, general people instead of just going straight to university as being the only source of some sort of career. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why like, we, we were quite like, impressed with what you were doing because it should have been done a long time ago. And it's the only way it can be done is for people like ourselves to just do it, you know? Exactly. Like when, I, when I was doing my research, um, sort of thinking, like, had this been done before, I, I came across maybe, I think, two agencies and they were both for like, magicians and clowns and stuff. And I was like, what about TV and film actors? Because that's what we specialise in. We, we sort of were a screen agency. I mean, like, I am wanting to get into theatre and things like that because it's always been a love of mine and a lot of my actors started out in it. But there, there was nothing for, for screen talent whatsoever. When, uh, when talent does, like, um, you know, get in touch and wants to be involved with the talent agency, what's the kind of advice you give to them when signing to an agent? Well, I think it totally depends. So whenever um, I sort of speak with someone, so there's like the initial contact I have with them, um, I'll ask for a monologue from a recent film or TV programme, um, sort of freshly recorded, because the thing is I get people who've had loads of experience and no experience, so I get sent showreels and stuff, but I, regardless of that, I ask everyone for a monologue just to sort of treat everyone fairly. And then from there, I will have a face-to-face -face interview where they can come and just tell me a bit more about what they've done in person. I could sort of gauge them and their personality. Because that, that's the thing. I can't speak for other agents, but for me, like personality and passion, it sounds cheesy, but they're the two things that I look for. I'm not necessarily looking for, you know, years and years of experience or like someone who's been going to stagecoach since they were three, like that sort of thing. I mean, I know a lot of agents do look for that, but my approach is slightly different. Makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, you're essentially selling their talents. So having a more bigger personality in that regard makes a lot of sense, right? 
Exactly, and like because I meet so many people, if you don't stand out, it sounds really harsh, but you're not going to stick in my mind. No, so no, personality yeah. is a really big thing. No, that makes total sense. Like you want to get the best out of your agency, and you're giving them the best that you can give, so you don't want any time exactly. wasters. Now, as well as the Daisy Hill agency, you also have your own film career. Um, how did you, yeah, yeah did. tell us about that. Tell us about how you got into filmmaking. Oh, okay. So, drama and acting was like, always my love um, through school, and I've always been very creative, like from GCSE options to the things I did at college. Nothing was ever academic for me. I did like drama, photography, IT, media, film, and all that sort of thing. So I did film theory at college, um, which was really cool because I've always been quite into like history as well, so learning about the politics behind film and sort of how it's developed and things like that were really fascinating. But I never I never actually made a film in college whatsoever. So then I went to university in Cardiff and did uh, a film degree there. Well, well, part of one, it didn't really work out for me, so I, I came back and then I went to Solon. And the difference between Solon and Cardiff is that in Cardiff it was totally uh, academic again, so I still didn't have the chance to make a film. And then coming to Solent to do my degree in film there, they were like, oh, you're going to make films now. And I was like, <laughs> what? Because everyone had had so much experience or made things throughout their like their younger years or college or whatever, shot music videos for their friends, but I'd never done anything. I was like, well, I know how to write a story. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I made, I made a film in first year, a little five-minute short. Um, which I guess my, my focus has always been sort of on art direction, like historical fiction. So I found my, my sort of passion really early on. Uh, the first film I made was a 60s film. The second one I made was a 90s film, uh, 70s film, 80s film, and so on. Um, and then after uni, I made Texas Radio, and that was the sort of first film that I'd made not in an academic setting, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit more about a uh, Texas Radio show. Oh, it was so much fun. Oh, okay, so, again, sort of coming out of uni, but for my final major project or my dissertation, I had the chance to write a feature film. I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I don't have to write a dissertation. I don't have to do loads and loads and loads of research and, like, 25,000 however many words or whatever. I just got to write a feature film. I was like, great. I can hide in my room for, like, three months and just bash it out. And I sort of, I had an idea initially for it, which was totally different. It was like a British uh, social realist film set in the 70s. And my lecturer was like, come on, Abby, you've done that before. So I was like, okay, let's set something in America, still the 70s, um, <laughs> because sort of the 70s subculture and 70s music is something that I'm really, really into. So I came up with this idea, uh, wrote the feature film, had a bit of a house party for my birthday and invited everyone around, and we ended up doing a table read. Nice. this feature and it was oh it was so much fun and because everyone was a bit merry they were putting on the text and accents and everything like that and it was so good and I sort of sat around and looked at everyone and I was like just because this is an assignment I can't let this sort of die now and then I was like oh but I can't make the feature either because I need you know I need to go to Texas I need all this stuff da, 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 da. so I was like oh I'll just make a short um and then after uni died down I started writing it casting it um, we wrote some original music for it as well, and I think when we started writing the music, that's when the idea and the film really started to feel real. Because I, I always wanted an authentic soundtrack and did loads of research into like seventies music and how we can recreate sounds and things like that. And yeah, that's that's how the sort of fake band was born, I guess. And then the film came after that. I see. Um, I'm going to give him a little like kind of plug himself, but obviously um, you work quite closely with your partner Jack White. And uh, yeah, he was involved with the music and is a sound recordist in his own right. And it's, um, mm -hmm. it's, quite, it's quite nice because I've seen a, a, a few scripts and ideas you've got. And you're right, there's always a bit of an influence of um, like kind of 70s, 60s music. And if people want to see Texas Radio Show, they can check it out on your YouTube channel. Is that right? Yeah, and the soundtrack is also on Spotify under the, the band name Blue Demon Season. Awesome. We'll make sure to put some links uh, below so people can check that out. Cool, thanks. Now, um, we met at the end of November at Pastel Wasteland Film Festival. And uh, we only yes. briefly spoke. And then after that, we got you involved with as many projects as we possibly can. 
And like, I personally, yeah. you know, you were beyond valuable on the film set for acting at the beginning of the year. Like, oh, thank that. that was so much fun because that was my first feature that I'd ever worked on. It was, yeah, like, I, I couldn't imagine doing a feature without your, like, kind of uh, assistant directing skills, which is really cool. And then obviously after that, we did um, DV Mission, where fortunately yeah. it's now an award-winning short film. Uh, yeah, I'm so happy about that. That was so much fun. It was. So it, fun. It, it was because, as you know, DV Mission is a very much a collaborative kind of thing, and uh, we. It was really nice. All of us coming together. You bringing in your aesthetic kind of style. Us bringing in the way we cut and shoot. I, I thought it worked really nicely. Yeah, I definitely want to do it again next year. It was really good for me to sort of see, and I've learned this a lot from you actually. How you can still make quality stuff in such a short space of time yeah which I think that's so a, good these film challenges really get you into more of that understanding of you have to produce something of higher quality and you have a deadline and you can't just you know settle back and go oh well we can spend all day shooting that's gonna be fine you don't have all day you need to get it right no. when you want you know um, no. so on top of like obviously DV Mission and with everything else going on we have a lot of time to create and write films so what are you working on now? Or what do you want to do potentially this year or next year? Oh my God, there's so many things. <laughs> um, so are we, are we talking like sort of short term or like dream projects? That's the next question is dream projects. So let's, let's stick to reality and then we'll go and dream afterwards. Okay, okay. so um, with my production company and, and my agency, I always push my actors to have a go at writing stuff. Excellent. Even if they've never written before, I think it's a really good skill to have to be able to create your own story. So uh, we are pretty much finished up on the final draft of a sort of British gangster film that we were planning to shoot in June that one of my actors has written. Obviously, don't know what's going to happen with um, with that now, with with what's going on and stuff. But that is that is pretty much ready to go. And then, as I've mentioned to you. Before I'm writing a zombie film, uh, not zombie, vampire film, sorry, <laughs> which is crazy because I've never written a vampire film or even a horror in my life. <laughs> yeah, well, we're looking forward to uh, helping you with the production for that one when when we can, of course. I also oh, fun. I also know that we, you and I are working on a few uh, projects as well together. And I'm hoping that, like, yeah, we'll just... That the Daisy Hill will be similar to how we work and just trying to produce as many features to get them out to the audience is, is the best time for it yeah. right now. Yeah, I think the sort of the sort of formula I want to I want to go by um, is three sort of big projects a year. I'd really like to do like a short in the spring, a feature in the summer, and then a black and white film in the autumn. Nice. That's sort of what I want to do, obviously. I think it's quite manageable because I've still got to, you know, find my clients' work and things like that. But it also means that in the drier seasons, I can still be giving my actors work, like, within what we do. And, of course, collaborating with you guys and just making stuff, really. No, oh, that's awesome. And, uh, well, let's get to that final question. What is your dream project? Um, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, so I, I mentioned to you as well, I'm writing a book at the moment. Yes. That is also something that I could see being a film. I actually started it as a, as a script idea, so I'm going back and forth between the two mediums, which is really strange. But that's, I guess that's like a dream project, but it's actually sort of in the works at the moment, which is really cool. It's something to focus on. Um, I would love to actually make the feature of Texas Radio because what you've seen in the short like barely scratches the surface of what the actual story is. Um, so I'd love to like just go shoot in America, you know, that mixture of my actors and then talent found over there. It's going to be a big budget, of course, because they need a, an awesome van and things like that and just travelling pretty much across the West Coast. But that's like, that's a dream I'll probably never let go of because oh, it'd be so, so good. Well, you've and always then, got that proof of uh, proof of project as well, like from exactly. the short. Exactly, yeah, that's sort, of, that's sort of why I made the short because it's... It sort of gives me a little bit of faith that we're going to make the feature one day, and also I can show it off to people and be like, "Ah, oh, this is what this is what we could do," sort of thing. And then my final project um, is sort of an '80s social realist film set in Southampton, which is pretty cool. Um, sort of following the Skinhead era, 
But again, that's a, that's a big budget one. I'm going to need a lot of boats. <laughs> a lot of boats? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you See, very much. Probably... Oh, sorry. No, I just say... <laughs> no, I was just going to say that's probably my, my three. Um, yeah, big budget, sort of dream, dream projects. Excellent. Right, if you want to give yourself a plug, tell everyone about your websites and stuff, that would be awesome. Okay, so yeah, we are the Daisy Hills Company. Um, bit of a funky spelling, D-A-Z-E-Y, and then Hills, like more than one hill, company on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and then our website, and then you can find us on like Mandy and Star Now and things like that as well. Awesome. And of course, check out the YouTube channel. Yes, yes, I'll, um, I'll send you a link to that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Abby. Yeah, it's been good. Thank you. No worries. And you and Jack have a lovely day. And uh, yeah. We will. He says hi. <laughs> He's Hello. in the other room. Excellent. All right, we'll speak to you later. Have a good day. All right, bye. Bye. So now, guys, we're going to move on and talk about the hunt. Um, so with everything going on in the world right now, um, lots of production companies, we covered this a couple of weeks ago yeah, yeah. in one of our podcasts, that um, loads of production companies have basically decided to release their films on digital download. Um, so we actually watched The Hunt. We took advantage of it because it would have been yeah. on the cinema last week. Um, so yeah, we're going to cover that. What do you guys think? I'll start with Sam. <laughs> well, I know there's like, yeah, there's going to be contrast in the points. But um, I actually, yeah, I... I did quite enjoy The Hunt. Um, it's a film that has a lot of moments that really work, but it doesn't fully work as a film. Like, there are some really, like, it starts brilliantly. It works really nicely. Mm. There's some good actors they've chosen, some good comedy actors as well, so you know that you're watching something that's a bit more lighter. Um, I think that the problem with, the biggest problem with The Hunt is uh, Donald Trump. Because of the controversy that he built up himself, and the film had to be moved off schedule, it built the film to be much more bigger than what it is, and really it's just a bit of a fun sort of slightly cheesy kind of hunting people film. You know, it's not... The, the politics kind of work, they kind of don't. It's, you know. Yeah, I think originally whenever um, I first got wind of it and watched, the tr like, the... Um, the American version of the trailer, I think it was, it didn't seem as like comical. It seemed a lot more serious. So whenever you watch the the opening scenes and then what happens happens, you're kind of like, oh, okay, this is going in a different direction, which I liked. And like you said, it works. It works really nicely. Then it just felt like it got to a point halfway through the film where it became very aware of itself, and it 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 kind of lost. It lost my attention anyway. I don't know, because I, I like films that, that are aware of themselves. This film seemed like it was painfully unaware of itself, was my problem with it, is that is that it went to sort of a bit of a silly place with, with certain things, but then it kept relying on gimmicks to keep the story going and to yeah. keep the story fresh. Um, like, the, the, the whole beginning is just a series of... Is this the main character? No, they're dead. Is this the main character? No, they're dead. Which is, is really good. Well, it was really nice. Yeah, that was yeah, cool. It I was like cool. That. But then I feel like it needs to be backed up with with something that narratively and conceptually sort of is whole. Whereas that just felt like a gimmick because of the because it was just there and then there wasn't anything. Shock for shock, sick. It was after after sort of the the the, the scene where they they'd gone into that little shop and like you know it turned out to be kind of a trap. After that, it just seemed to go into this weird place where it was... Uh, the, the whole idea of it was you, you were questioning if uh, what was real and what wasn't real, but to me it seemed entirely obvious all the way through that nothing was really real and that they would be... And it, that was the same as the very beginning, that gimmick of you know misleading you with the with, with who the main character was it was then trying to mislead you with with what was real and what wasn't and it felt like because they'd done that it, it, it sort think, of took away that blow as well to back up that point ever so slightly the bit when um the american embassy person picks them up mm. from within the camp and then you like maybe it's just me and reading into dialogue and what have you it just seemed very very forced to mm. Like, for that perspective, it's it's almost straight in your face as an audience member. Oh, look, he's definitely a bad guy because of the dialogue. 
Yeah. And then the characters work it out. See, I just thought it was like a pulpy kind of 80s satire. Just having a bit of fun. Yeah, but the thing is, is I think that would have been fine had it not tried to be more than more than that. But in I don't terms think of it did. Because sort of, then, if the, I you look at films like The Stuff, no, I don't know. I don't. Movie, I don't. I don't agree that's with you. Pure I did think trash, it but really still, tried. Yeah. yeah, but with something like the uh, the stuff, it. it it analyzes society in a way that sort of makes sense and sort of is coherent and is a good criticism of society. And this just felt like it didn't do that. See, I mean, it, it, it had elements of it where it was sort of like laughing at the. It, I mean, it was taking the piss out of the the liberal elite, elites who didn't really care about killing people, but at the same time wouldn't want to misgender or or use a racial slur or anything like that. And you kind of think, well, what's the? That's a weird sort of um, dual morality in it, yeah. isn't it? But at the same time, I, I felt like, yeah, it just didn't have a full discussion about about the whole sort of uh, what was what happened and what went on during during that time. With I think the deplorables and the liberal. Elite. I think you were like, expecting think, too much in that respect. I think because we're living in such divisive times, the, the fact there's no clarity there, and it just wanted to be a bit gory because it was very gory film. Mm. There were some great gore scenes in it. So yeah, the uh, the main actress Betty Gilpin. Um, she was really great in it. Like she had that whole Kurt Russell thing going on, and she's from the uh, TV show Glow. And I know, like, arguably, because the film wasn't as big as it thought it was, it doesn't work in respect to the intro. But the intro, when you see the first person who dies, it's Emma Roberts. People know who Emma Roberts is. I think she only had like one bit of dialogue, didn't she? Yeah. The other dudes <laughs> after that, I don't know who he is, but I'm sure people do after the other people, you know. <laughs> that was and then funny. the other guy in the house, in the house, sorry, in the shop, that's Ike Berez, maybe that's his last name, but he's a comedy actor. So it almost does that psycho thing, because Betty Gilpin has not been in many films, it's trying to introduce a new sort of iconic character. But that which to is, me is a gimmick, it's just a gimmick. Yeah, but that's the thing, that, where I was going to say after that is that it's, it's difficult for a film that doesn't have... You know, when you're standing... The problem of any sort of film like that is you really need to be smarter than than, than what people are expecting for the, to create that kind of iconic character. By putting all those placements in to go, ah, oh, this is going to be an iconic character, but then the film not to put it off towards the end is kind of disappointing. Um, but I like the direction. I thought there were some really cool shots. I, I really like the director anyway. He did a film called Compliance, which is a much better film. Compliance is a much smaller story. You can tell that like it has all those moral questions, but it's just it just works so much better. Um, compared I don't to know, this. I, the, the, the problem with me is that if you if you're going to talk about sort of politics in any kind of respect, or, or you're going to sort of like look at social um, issues like problems between sort of working class and and elites or something like that you need to have done your research you need to have like looked at it and thought about what you're trying to say and what your argument is and i don't think that that did that so i would rather it had just gone to that you know the more basic level of if it had just been a film about people uh, the rich hunting people or, or something along those lines um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have had a Could problem have with it. Just been rich and poor, couldn't it? Exactly, but they had to bring that political element. Well, it's because into that's it. what America is dealing with right now. Like we're British, we get to see it from one perspective. But if you were over there, then that's all you. If it's to do with divisiveness, and a satirical element where it's us versus them, which is what it does. It brings down to that purer sense. It does, but then I think uh, I'm with Jack on this. Is that they don't the ex well the execution isn't. As strong then, if that's what you're trying to base the film around to showcase what's going on in America, then it needs to be solid. Whereas yeah, I mean, it's very, very almost to me, it felt like it had created its own alternate universe within the film, um, and we're just meant to believe that oh, okay, that's the way that their universe is, that's their reality, and we're just along for the ride and um, for the duration of the film. But if it if it is trying to represent like. The, the state of play in America, I don't feel like it did a very good representation of it. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I follow quite a lot of American politics. I, you know, I listen to a lot of things that are going on in America, and I've got to say that that's part of the reason that it disappointed me because it didn't really look at what these, you know, deplorables. 
it, it didn't really analyse them correctly. It just or made them, them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were just characters a in a in a yeah, I know, no, but they no, were just no. characters in a situation. There was no there was no development on that much really of of who they were as people. And I, I, I know that that you know that's not the kind of film that you're trying to make. But then again, don't go into that. It's the deeper question then when it comes to satire, really, isn't it? Like, if you're doing satire for entertainment basis, but you are looking at, like, a weird comparison, but Team America, that's a satire. Yeah. It's not that deep. It has I some would say, deeper no, elements. I would, say, I would have... say Team America is really quite deep, actually. It, it, yeah, there, there are deep <laughs> elements to it. But like, I mean, I don't agree with all of its ele like everything that its argument is making yeah. in terms of you know what it what it's saying socially. But I can appreciate that it's a very very deep film. Whereas this film, it's not that I disagree with it. It's that it it just doesn't go that deep. That's the thing. I I don't know whether every satirical um, entertainment has to go as, as deep. It needs to have those ideas on there. But at the same time, the audience that it's trying to attract is not the audience. Who may be so politically inclined, like yeah, but you don't you don't need to you don't need to necessarily do it to reach that specific audience. You you know if you're if you're painting a picture, it can be it can be hidden within it that that certain audiences can see it. I mean, you certainly see it with with kids films all the time. There's certain like political messages. There's oh, certain um, you know adult humor woven within there, and that's kind of what I I mean by that is you don't need like it's not that it should. Uh, you know, be uh, like only accessible to the people who fully understand politics. Of course not. But if you're going to talk about politics, you know, I just think it's it. kind of refreshing to just have something a bit that was just kind of like, I just I just had fun with it. That's it. I didn't really care about the politics, and just like you, I look at politics. But that film was nice to not overly think about it too much. And I just had fun with the characters. I liked the set pieces. The, the score was terrible. The music was awful. It was just so generic. And, and that was kind of weird. Because like, cause Bloomhouse was a production company behind it. And Bloomhouse, in recent years, have, they've, they've gone you know, hit and miss. Sometimes they can hit, hit it right out of the park, like it did with The Invisible Woman. Fantastic film. The Invisible Man. <laughs> every time. <laughs> with The Invisible Man, they, they succeeded on every level. And it just works so well. The Hunt doesn't work as strongly, and it's a shame because maybe Bloomhouse are releasing too many films. They also had Fantasy Islands in February, which I don't think anyone's going to remember anytime soon. And yeah, I Didn't don't even know. Didn't know that came <laughs> I like I like studios who take risks, and when Jason Bloom was saying this is going to be as culturally relevant as uh, Get Out, everyone kind of was like, eh, really? <laughs> and uh, no, it's not. It's not as culturally as relevant mm -hmm. as Get Out. Get Out is a unique moment that you know it's going to be hard to surpass in that regards. And I think um, it should be encouraged for studios to make these sort of films, especially in a time now where safety is going to be what people are going to be thinking there's going to be more of, that sense of security of, like, actually, we can tell stories that aren't, you know, pushing it too far. And they'll just get shoved onto VOD sites, the stories that are pushing it. So I appreciate the fact that they did that with The Hunt. It just didn't achieve it well. And um, with the writer, uh, Damien Lindhoff, who... People have like lots of different opinions on him because he's obviously the guy who co-created Lost. And I know people have their opinions on Lost. I didn't watch it enough, but I watched Watchmen, which yeah. was a masterpiece. Yeah. I think this is why I was so disappointed in The Hunt because Watchmen is fantastic. Yeah. And, and I love Blumhouse as well. Um, so seeing that, that, you know, they were working together to create this, I was really excited. I was really, and, it, and especially it being about American politics, I was like, this is right in my element. And that's that, I think that maybe I overbuilt it for myself. And yeah, it was. I think you were probably more disappointed in it than I was. Mm. I didn't really go into it with any preconceived ideas other than what I mentioned earlier, as I thought it was going to be a lot more serious than what it was. But as soon as it opened, I was like, oh, okay, I'm on board with this. And it gets to about the halfway point, and I just lost interest. Mm. I remember I was sitting there, and I was just kind of like, okay, kind of hurry up and end. And then it gets to the end with the <clears throat> the fight scene. And um, I just wasn't invested. I wasn't that invested at all. Like, And they, they kind of hinted at it earlier on in the film, where it's like, oh, she's been training for eight months. It's like, oh, right, okay, but what's the backstory of this main character then? You know that she like it served in Iraq or Afghanistan, I think it was, but like I I don't know. It just I I wasn't interested. I See, just this, this completely. Thing, I, I find it 
not like, I don't know, because I just think of other, particularly male characters, in the 80s again, your Kurt Russell type characters, the lone soldiers who go out and they'll be like, I'm a soldier, blah, blah, blah. No one wants to know their backstory. So I find it, I, I don't know, I find it strange that people are curious of the, the backstory it's to not, the character, but I get it. Don't correct, no, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not saying we had to have a, a full, like, in detail backstory on her, but just a bit more, like, substance. It, like, the reveal at the end is just basically, oh yeah, there's another person with the same name. I don't think it was backstory. I think, to me, it felt like almost personality like it, it started off like her seeming like she would have like a lot of personality but in the end it sort of became like this just one track one dimension it was, it was all, it, you know how she was pulling a lot of faces towards the end that felt like the the sort of extent of her character to me and that's why I sort of had a bit of a mm. again like like yeah, she was a strong character that was going around and fighting and doing all of that. And, you know, that's reminiscent of those 80s films. But, and the male characters in those. But uh, at the same time, uh, like, those male characters were strong in personality, in all those other not things. Always, and I felt, man. well, maybe not, There's but, like, forgiving but they, were, they, were, they, were written, they were written with that in mind, if you know what I mean. Whereas this doesn't, again, it just doesn't feel like, and I'm not saying her performance either, I don't, because I don't know what happened on the set, but it just felt to me like, you know, I agree with it didn't you on work that. as well. I think, yeah, personality wise, it, like whenever you first get introduced to her and she plays that little trick on the, the gas station people, that was really cool. And like, you're invested then, it's like, what? How does she know that? And then she like <clears throat> works out all these other stuff of um, the tricks and part of the game. Um, but then it didn't ever develop or grow anymore. It was just kind of, that was it. What you see is what you get. I don't know. That That's just my personal kind of views on it. So out of 10, Jackson, I'll start with you. Uh... <sighs> You see, I think there was a, like a lot of there were good elements, and I'm I'm focusing in on the bad elements because that's what you tend to do in it when you when you see a film that disappoints you. But um, so I would say probably about a five. I think it was it was the the gore was good in it. Yeah. Um, a lot of the performances were cool in it. Um, it wasn't like, I mean, there wasn't anything sort of like uh, that really stood out about the cinematography, but there was nothing bad about it either. Um, it to me was just let down by the concept. Sam? I hate to do 0.5s, but, <laughs> but uh, 6.5. Oh, really? Yeah, like, because when I first watched it, I was more into it, but then when you when I walked away and thought about the characters a bit more and a bit more of the storytelling, and, and a lot of the, the, the lines, the one-liners... And us beating you up, like, <laughs> while we've been in lockdown. <laughs> Why did you lie in? <laughs> so, yeah, 6.5. Okay, and I'd probably give it a 5 as well um, for everything that Jack just said Gore was good uh, I like the way um, the way that the main bad guy character a bad lady character you never saw her face until it got towards the end of the film I loved all them behind shots and stuff thought that was really cool um, so yeah five so guys thank you for listening as ever uh, give us a like Give us a comment if you want us to review anything um, or even if you just want to give us some general feedback. Um, and also, give us a subscribe. Other than that, join us next week for another edition of Trash Arts Take. Trash Arts Take out! Ta-da! Bye.